uh, about microplastics in the Arctic that will talk a little bit more about operational aspects and, um, and help. Um, so IARPIC Interagency Arctic Research Policy, uh, Policy Committee uh, brings together leaders from the, the U.S. agencies to enhance collaboration of research in the Arctic, and IARPIC Collaborations is kind of the, the public uh, branch of that. Um, so IARPIC just released its Arctic Research Plan 2022-2026, and it's currently developing the first uh, biennial, biennial implementation plan, which is scheduled for release in September. Um, so both the physical oceanography collaboration team and the modeling collaboration team will be part of the, the next phase, and we're very excited of, um, on contributing uh, to that. So the microplastics pollution in the Arctic is, um, is very relevant to priority area four, risk management and hazard mitigation, as well as priority area one on community resilience and health. Um, so we have two presentations today by, by Eric van Sabia and Elatia Manfred. Um, so Eric is a, uh, got a PhD from Utrecht University in 2009, was a postdoc at the University of um, Miami, uh, and a postdoc and lecturer at the University of New South Wales, a lecturer at Imperial College of London, and he's now a full professor in oceanography and public engagement at the Utrecht University. Um, he's going to be talking about the mapping the origins, transport, and fate of floating plastic in the Arctic. Um, and with that, I'd, I'd like to hand it over to, uh, to Eric, if you want to uh, go to share your screen. Thank you, Wilbert, and thanks for, um, for all the organizers of this, uh, of this session and the opportunity to, uh, to give this presentation. Yeah, so what you see here on the right is a map of all the surface drifters out of the NOAA Global Drifter Database uh, that they maintain out of uh, AOML in, in, in Miami. Um, 20,000 and counting drifters floating around uh, in most of the oceans, but not really much in the Arctic, right? And of course, that's because of the sea ice. So these are surface drifters. They've got a, um, a satellite communication device, a GPS, they don't do very well in, uh, in sea ice environments. So this is one of the blank spots on the globe, if you want, in terms of tracking how uh, ocean currents move stuff around. And that's also then, I guess, why we need simulations, why we need models to try and understand how the ocean currents, especially in the Arctic, move plastic from one location to the other, move it into the Arctic and what happens inside the Arctic. Now, this is a um, very, very timely presentation. And actually, when I got the invitation, I had no idea that the timing would be so perfect. We did it because actually, two days ago, um, we published a paper, or actually, uh, Melanie Bergman, who's the, uh, the first author, and probably a lot of you uh, will know her, um, published a paper, a, re a review article in Nature um, on plastic pollution in the Arctic. And actually, most of what I will be showing today will come from that paper because it is a very extensive overview of, in particular, where all this plastic is, a little bit also on why it got there and also on um, what the impacts are. But I understand that uh, the, the, the impacts of the, this plastic will be uh, the, the topic of next month, so I'll really only very briefly show that, uh, that figure. Um, but yeah, we know much more now about plastic pollution in the Arctic than we did say a decade ago. And in fact, I, th I think it would be nice to start with this map, which is the map that I, uh, together with colleagues, uh, especially Cara Levener Law out of uh, <coughs> NPA, in, uh, um, that, we, that, that we came up with in 2015. And at that time, it was the, the best estimate of the distribution of microplastic on the surface of our oceans. And you could now say, well, the surface of our oceans, really not all of them. Sure, we got uh, the, the temperate oceans quite well and, and with reasonably good coverage there. But you see big gray areas um, in the Southern Ocean and especially in the Arctic. At that time, we really had no idea about how much plastic was floating around in the, um, in the, new, in the surface of the Arctic. There's only a few, if, a few years later that the first data sets came out. And I think that the most important of those early 
data sets was the one from the for, from the Tara expedition. So the schooner, the Tara, which which has been um, well known for its uh, 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 microbial biology work and its microbial genetics work in particular, they also um, did a, a circle around the uh, around the Arctic, and as they sampled there, they also um, measured and counted plastic that they found, the microplastic that fits into a manta troll. And by the way, when I say microplastic, and also on the previous slide, I mean essentially more small plastic, everything that fits within a manta troll uh, mesh, uh, no, uh, mouth, and, and wouldn't pass through the mesh size. So anything between, say, a third of a millimeter and 20 to 30 centimeters or so. Anyway, on this data set, which didn't go into the eyes, as you can see, um, they circumnavigated uh, the Arctic and found some places where there was still no plastic at that time. So they found some blues and some of them were actually points with literally zero plastic in the net, which at that point was actually remarkable. We hardly ever encountered that anymore in the, in the open ocean. But at the same time, it was very clear that there was a big hotspot of plastic accumulation here um, in the uh, in the Barents Sea and in the uh, um, in the Atlantic part of the um, of, of of the Arctic. Now, those concentrations are almost on par with, say, the concentrations in the um, in subtropical gyres, a factor two or so lower, but certainly almost the same order of magnitude. So this is a lot of plastic that ends up there. And when we wrote the paper. I was involved a bit with the modeling part of this. Um, the idea was that this was because of essentially the Gulf Stream, right? And that's also why we drew it up here. And that this, um, the, the, and the North Atlantic Current, that it brings a lot of um, mid-latitude and low-latitude uh, plastic into the Arctic like this. Now I would draw slightly differently, but I will come to that uh, uh, in a few slides. Now, so this was the first data set, extensive data set of plastic in the Arctic. Since then, many, many more expeditions have mapped plastic in the Arctic. And one of the key things that, uh, that Melanie did in the, in the review article is that she combined all of these data sets. So here it's not so much about the amount of plastic as it is about where plastic was found in, um, in the Arctic, and both in terms of where it is. So here it is uh, in sea ice, on the beach, on the surface, uh, pelagic, on the seafloor or other. And um, if it's, uh, it's yellow, then there was plastic. Um, or, and if it's white and, uh, and gray, there was hardly any plastic. And what you see is that actually, even though on some of the coastlines of Siberia um, are still pretty pristine, especially in the open ocean, almost everywhere you see plastic now, you find plastic also in the Arctic, including close to the North Pole. Now, that Arctic, that plastic then also has an impact on marine life, and that's what you see over here. So what that does and how it in, um, interacts um, and what happens to that plastic. So with all this data, and then also trying to the numbers, we came up with a, an estimate of really the extent, the amount of plastic that is uh, that's now in the Arctic. So essentially the stocks, uh, how much is where and, and the fluxes, how much is going where. And you see that indeed, um, that constraints are much lower, fortunately, than, uh, than on, the, uh, on the surface of the of subtropical gyres, but still relatively high. We find plastic everywhere. Um, and I don't think it makes much sense now to go through all these numbers individually, but you see that, that we now have estimates, even though sometimes they have a huge range uh, because we just don't know how much is there. Um, but we have the first estimates of all the plastic in, in, in the Arctic. And that then also um, has an implication, of course, for the marine ecosystems, because I think that, as I also often say in the media, I mean, I'm a Professor of Public Engagement for a reason, I guess, is that um, that so plastic anywhere in the ocean, of course, is an atrocity, and we should be ashamed. But I think that particularly in the Arctic, we should be worried because the Arctic is already under pressure. The ecosystems in the Arctic are uh, the most under pressure almost of anywhere because of climate change. Because the Arctic is, as you all know, warming faster than any other place on the planet. It may be here that the marine plastic might be extra 
detrimental to marine life. And it may just be the, the drip that, that tips the bucket, um, uh, proverbially speaking. So the impact is important and we don't know. And the problem is really that a lot we don't know. Um, there's some good news. So uh, especially for the midwater uh, feeding species that there's been a low level of, uh, of, of plastic, um, but especially the seabirds and uh, the, the species on, on land are exposed to plastic and have been found to actually ingest it. So the question is then, well, where does it come from? Where does all this plastic come from? And it turns out to be a very, very difficult uh, question, especially for the microplastics, because from microplastic, you can't really trace anymore. You can't detect where it is from. You can't say like, like, a, like an archeologist or so asking, well, what is the origin of this type of plastic? Is it from fisheries? Is it from um, marine uh, or, 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 or you know, from rivers? But what we do know are that there are direct routes, for example, from, well, where I live in the um, in Netherlands, directly into the Arctic. And this is one of the simulations, one of the very first simulations, actually, that we did with our, our, our parcels tool. I'll come to that in the next slide. But you see here um, a release of virtual pieces of plastic from both the Thames and the, the Rotterdam, uh, the Rhine River mouse. And you see that, well, initially it lingered a little bit around in the North Sea. At some point, it very quickly goes through the North, uh, uh, the Norwegian current, and then quite quickly into the Arctic. And in this simulation, it kind of lingers around again in the Barents Sea on timescales, and it has ages now of a year, maybe uh, one and a half years or so. It doesn't really protrude further much um, uh, beyond 18 North into the, the, into the, the, the pack ice of the Arctic or the sea ice of the Arctic. Um, it does go around. Uh, the uh, Greenland, so Femke would be interested in that. And then some of it even returns on timescales of a few years back uh, into, the, uh, into, the, into the North Atlantic subtropical gyre. So we do this simulation with, um, with parcels, our, um, our parcels tool, which, which stands for probably a really computationally efficient Lagrangian simulator, I guess with the, uh, the emphasis on probably, or so we're going to work on that. But it is by now, after seven years of development, a fairly um, expensive, uh, extensive and, um, and a well-developed set of Python classes and methods to build your own Lagrangian model. So it's not a Lagrangian model, it's a toolbox to build Lagrangian models. And the key thing, and what makes it particularly useful to, to study something like transport of plastic, is that it is relatively easy to incorporate what we call behavior through, uh, through custom kernels, um, anything that you can code in an equation, you can put as a forcing on the particles. So the particles can change their, um, their depth, their location, not only by the affection of currents, but also by things like biofouling or by sinking or by ice, uh, ice movement or ice rafting. Uh, all of that we've done before. I don't have time here to show it all uh, or by beaching, um, but it is where, um, where ocean parcels really, really excels in, I think. Now, finally, I, I understand that this, that this um, that this discussion is mostly about microplastic, but uh, and, and most of my work so far has been about microplastic. But lately, I've started to to grow more fond of the macro plastic problem, because and I think for two reasons. I think that we should focus more on microplastics. First of all, because for microplastic, you can actually hope to find out where something came from. Um, through, say, litter ID workshops, as, as my colleagues in Wageningen um, are, are doing, so Wadri and Schiepman here, really very carefully analyzing what is this item? What is the story that this item tells us? And thereby, hopefully, getting more feeling for what the possible sources of the, of, of, of the microplastic are. But the other reason why macroplastic in particular are, um, are very important to study, I guess, is because those are the things that you can still clean up from a beach. Um, and of course, the, uh, so, so most microplastics in the ocean originate from fragmentation of, of macroplastic or fragmentation of larger pieces of plastic. So cleaning up one large bottle from a beach or even from an ocean somewhere may prevent millions of pieces of microplastics. 
Um, the only way I, I so often get people asking, what do we do about the plastic that is in our ocean? And really the best solution I think is to clean up the big stuff before it ends up in small stuff. And if you want to do that, then we want to know where it is. We know where it comes from. We know how it moves around. And that is, um, at least for me, my new uh, um, research questions, focusing on entire bottles, entire bags, and their dynamics in the oceans. Now, finally, I showed you these, uh, the simulations of parcels that didn't really end up very far into the Arctic. There are other simulations that do a much better job, and especially if they also include uh, the sources from, uh, from, from, from rivers in, uh, in Siberia. And this is a simulation, for example, from a recent paper um, by Husebret and et al., where they showed that the pathways of, of particles can really get quite deep into the Arctic. Um, and indeed, if you look at the time scales, uh, it can linger there for years and years until it really in, in ends up in the, uh, in the Beaufort Shire. So I think that there's much more also to study there. And I'm really happy that other groups uh, around the world, including some of the people who are out here, that they are starting to work on this problem on trying to find out how um, the ocean currents move plastic around. Because that's not only important for the fate of the plastic, it's also important to understand how ocean currents work, right? Because even though it is an atrocity, all this plastic ling lingering in the ocean, it may also be an opportunity. It may have a bit of a silver lining where we actually learn more about ocean dynamics by studying the dispersion and the distribution of plastic in our ocean. And with that, I leave you with these very three simple conclusions um, and I'm ready. Thank you. Terrific, Eric. It was really, really very authoritative overview of the, the microplastics research and the, now also the macroplastics research that you're that, that you and your group and the community that you built around uh, about that activity um, have, have developed and the insights. That's that's great. Um, my suggestion would be to. Uh, have the next uh, press presenter, Alicia Manford, and to save questions for uh, the discussion afterwards or for uh, for the chat. Um, so I'd like to hand it over to Alicia. Um, she is, uh, as she said, she did her PhD um, on microplastics and has a study on microplastics in sea ice, and we're very interested to hear about that. Um, Eric has been is an expert on Lagrangian modeling of uh, of microplastics. Uh, I think Alatia and um, um, Miguel uh, Morales Marqueda have been working more on a Eulerian approach to uh, to microplastics modeling. So her presentation is um, is called "Modeling the Transport and Accumulation of Microplastics in Arctic Sea Ice." Uh, and with that, I'd like to hand it over to her. If you want to share your presentation. So please ask your uh, questions for Eric in the chat and we can uh, just, uh, have a discussion after LTR's uh, presentation. Sorry everyone, I realized I was still muted there. <laughs> thank you very much, Walter. Well um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, as I say, I recently finished my PhD um, at Newcastle University. Um, and this is uh, where all this research came from. Um, so we had a really, really thorough, lovely overview from Eric about um, floating plastics making their way into the Arctic. Um, I was really excited to see his paper coming out uh, the other day. Um, really interesting read. You should definitely have a look at it. So once these plastics make their way into the Arctic, um, what happens next? So not only for floating plastics, um, but for other plastics as well. So this is the same paper that Eric shared with us before, um, theorizing the Arctic Ocean is a dead end for floating plastics um, that enter the Arctic from the North Atlantic branch of thermohaline circulation and showed this high accumulation of plastics in surface waters um, in the Eurasian basin and not so much um, elsewhere really. Um, so if these plastics are making their way into the Arctic, what can then happen to them? So obviously the Arctic is a really important area for um, deep water formation um, and you have strong vertical convection during the winter months. 
Um, and these are some results from one of our simulations that show that even floating buoyant plastics can be drawn down through the water column um, via strong vertical convection to depths of over a thousand meters in places. And from there, they could either continue to be vertically mixed downwards through the water column where they'll eventually perhaps end up on the seafloor or within uh, Arctic sediments, or they could then become resuspended once again as um, the strong mixing weakens uh, into spring and summer. Microplastics have been found in subsurface waters, in uh, throughout the water column, on the seafloor and within sediments. Um, and like I say, that review paper um, that came out a couple of days ago has a really thorough um, overview of where we might find plastics. But if these plastics don't end up on the seafloor, where, where else we might, might we find them? Um, and the obvious question is, uh, are we finding them in Arctic sea ice? Um, obviously, sampling in sea ice is quite a challenge. Um, quite often people are limited to sampling within the summer months. Um, you've got to think about the, the costs as well associated, and also just the difficulty of um, keeping these samples, these ice cores, um, like stored in such a way that you're not going to have contamination or loss of fibers. Um, so these are just a few studies um, that I've highlighted to the best of my knowledge. The first one that was published was only back in 2014. So like Eric says, um, we've learned a lot in the past decade. Um, but the one that I'd like to highlight is the bottom one. So this was a paper that came out in 2018 um, by Pika et al, um, who took a, a number of ice cores right the way across um, the Arctic basin. Um, and as we saw with Eric's talk, the North Atlantic is a really important source of microplastics into the Arctic. And unsurprisingly, we can see that the highest concentrations of microplastics in sea ice, at least in, in this study, um, are around Greenland and around Svalbard and are towards the North Atlantic sector as opposed to anywhere else in the Arctic, reaching concentrations of up to 12 million microplastics per meter cubed of sea ice. Um, so in this work, they did some um, backtrack trajectory modeling as well um, to try and establish where the plastics came from. But the issue is, as I said, with sampling, you're only getting a snapshot and it's so expensive. Um, and this is where modeling is a really helpful tool to help us um, without having to go there and have a look ourselves, establish where plastics might be coming from and where they might eventually end up. Um, so, We've developed um, not a Lagrangian, I'm afraid to say, for those people that are interested in Lagrangian modeling, an Eulerian model um, using NEMO. Um, so this was a one degree resolution model that we initially started up just as a global model um, to look at the distribution of microplastics globally in the ocean. Um, but then we got interested in what might happen with plastics in the Arctic. So we started with our inputs at zero and increased them over time to um, to simulate uh, increasing microplastic um, inputs into the ocean that we might have had since the 1950s or when large scale production of plastics began. Um, we only took into account land-based sources um, because that's the data that we had, um, thankfully from Eric, um, at right at the start of my PhD. Um, so as I say, only land-based sources um, as we know, the Arctic is a really important region for fishing, um, for shipping, for uh, tourism as well. So there may be varying um, degrees of accuracy and there might be regions that may have higher areas of accumulation than this model um, suggests. So the, re the way that we um, modeled the incorporation of microplastics into sea ice was basically through three different ways. Um, so the, it was quite simple. Um, if I'm afraid I don't have a more detailed um, model that has the incorporation of microplastics into it. So um, through basal accretion, so the freezing of the microplastics in at the base of the sea ice, um, and similarly basal melt, so plastics can be re-released again um, as it melts at the bottom, and through surface melt um, as well. Um, and then as it snows, um, the bottom layers of the snow may sink below the water column, um, and then you'll have the influx of plastic laden waters into the snow and get a snow ice plastic matrix formation. Um, this model doesn't have any atmospheric um, sources either. Um, as we saw in Eric's slides, um, Arctic snow may have really high concentrations of pl microplastics in them, but 
at this point, we really don't know. It was um, a little bit too complicated for us to, to have any sort of par parameterization of microplastics um, entering the Arctic through atmospheric deposition. So these are some of the results um, from our model, just outputs every 10 years. Um, so as we can see um, at the beginning of the simulation, um, in the 10th year, the highest accumulation we have is um, towards the North Atlantic sector. So particularly around Novaya Zemlya and in the Eurasian basin, um, which are areas of um, high productivity and you'd expect high fishing areas as well. So even though we've got high areas of accumulation there now with only land-based sources, we could potentially theorize that these uh, areas may have even more microplastic accumulation than we have um, in the model at the moment. Um, so the plastics enter there up past the Norwegian coast and up through Novaya Zemlya and into the Eurasian basin. But by the end of um, the simulation, that's not actually where we find the highest areas of uh, accumulation of plastics. They're around the north coast of Greenland um, and towards the Canadian archipelago. And this is through the long range transport of these microplastics within the sea ice. Um, so via the transpolar drift, um, they're being transported away from where the highest, um, highest entry um, quantities would be um, and into places that may not have any local sources um, apart from fishing and other things like that. Um, and towards the Amerasian basin as well, we can see that we're getting higher, higher areas of accumulation than you may expect, um, considering there's very little inflow of microplastics through the Bering Strait and not too many local sources as well. So we can see that microplast um, microplastics are gonna be, gonna be transported over quite long distances um, in the sea ice. But obviously sea ice isn't there um, the whole year round. Um, we have seasonal growth and retreat of, of the Arctic sea ice. Um, so we would expect that there's gonna be some sort of release over time as well. Um, so these are just some seasonal plots. And you can see that again, even in, in the summer months when you've had sea ice retreat, there are still very high, um, high quantities of microplastics, particularly around the north of Greenland and the Canadian archipelago. Um, and while we have a steady raise um, in microplast the mass of microplastics, not only in the sea ice, but in, in the um, water column below, you can see this seasonal fluctuation um, over the years as the microplastics are captured and then released again um, by the sea ice. So that was quite a quick one, I'm afraid. Um, just some quick conclusions. Um, most of the microplastics we can see are entering the Arctic from the North Atlantic, um, but despite this, we're still getting high accumulations in areas where you don't have such high inputs. Um, so towards the Amerasian basin um, and along the Russian coast, um, which shows that sea ice is a really important vector for the long range transport of microplastics. And obviously we're gonna have the seasonal capture and release of these microplastics. Um, so Arctic sea ice isn't, uh, isn't gonna capture all these microplastics forever. And particularly with climate change and sea ice decline in the Arctic, this could well release a legacy of microplastics that have been trapped in multi-year ice. Um, we don't know what sort of quantities we may end up with being released in areas that are normally pristine because they've been transported there within the sea ice. Um, so what next? Um, our model didn't have any parameterization of the vertical distribution of microplastics within the sea ice. At present, there are no clear trends um, of the vertical distribution of the, pl the plastics within sea ice. So we can't really tell whether microplastics are being trapped more within the surface layers um, or being deposited there through atmospheric deposition or whether they're being um, accreted at the base of, of the ice sheets and um, whether they're going in that way, how long they're retaining within the sea ice. Um, so that would be a really, really interesting thing to be thinking about um, over the next few years. Um, as I said, the inclusion of atmospheric deposition, um, there's already evidence of microplastics in Arctic sea ice um, and being deposited on ice flows. Even up Everest, we're getting de um, deposition of microplastics. So it's pretty much everywhere. Um, but the issue is thinking about what sort of levels we would expect to see um, being deposited in these remote regions um, via snow um, and just Aeolian transport. 
And finally, our model didn't include any um, interannual variability. So we couldn't, um, couldn't really establish what differences in um, sea ice growth and sea ice retreat were over the years. Um, and particularly with climate change, um, including some sort of interannual variability. So we could see what possibly the worst case scenario is with um, increased Arctic sea ice decline um, would be a really valuable contribution, I think. Um, with that, thank you very much. Um, if you've got any questions, feel free to drop me an email um, or tweet me. And thank you very much for having me. Terrific. Thanks, Alicia. That was very, very insightful. And um, I'm pretty sure that there are many questions. Some uh, correspondence is already going on in the chat. Um, I think I'd like to open the floor for, um, for questions. So if anybody has a question for Alicia or Eric, um, and you can also uh, repeat the question that you that you put in the chat. If uh, maybe we can um, maybe can uh, yeah, if you can. Hola, I think you have your your hand up. Let's uh, let's start with you. So maybe you can, uh, if you have a question, just uh, raise your hand, and I'll I'll call on. Okay, uh, so I put the question in in the chat also, but um, obviously. Uh, the presence of microplastics in the Arctic is a sign of, you know, what we're doing to our planet. But um, are there any direct physical impacts of the microplastics in the Arctic? Or have people looked at this at all? Uh, you know, are there impacts on the ice formation or ice melt? Are there impacts on like surface albedo? And of course, uh, the question is uh, the biological impacts on on the fauna and 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 the smaller creatures. Yeah, uh, do you want to go? Uh, you're, you're welcome to. I, I know there's um, definitely some information in that, uh, in your paper about that. <laughs> yeah, well, so I think, um, so fortunately, the concentrations are still low enough that I wouldn't expect any albedo impact. Um, I don't know about ice formation. I mean, that is that is a bit too far from my expertise field. Um, but don't think that there are entire islands of trash or so in the Arctic, right? There's fortunately still mostly ocean and every now and then a piece of plastic. I, I've, I've, I've been for years, I've been trying to push the term uh, plastic bouillon rather than plastic soup, right? Because it is a very, very, very thin uh, bouillon of tiny pieces of plastic. Now, in terms of harm, that's more difficult, right, to, to marine ecosystems. I mean, uh, harm is a super complicated question. It starts with, is there um, interaction? Do organisms actually uh, ingest the plastic or interact with plastic? And the second question is that, well, does it actually harm them? Um, but that is, I think, far beyond what we can discuss here. I also don't think that the jury is really out, but that is uh, maybe what uh, in a month's time on the 5th of May, if you tune in again, then uh, maybe you get more answers on that there. Great, thanks. Um, uh, thank you. Sorry. All right, if, if not, um, David? Sure. Um, so maybe this is more for Alethea. I was looking at the sources of where the microplastics were sort of getting into the Arctic Ocean. And, and I mean, if I interpreted the one plot right, it seems like there was more sort of over towards the North Atlantic side. I mean, what about the big Russian rivers, you know, the Mackenzie River in Canada? Are there, are there other plastics coming out of those sources too and getting into the Beaufort Sea. Yeah, rivers are definitely a really important source, especially in the Arctic. Um, we unfortunately didn't include any riverine sources. Um, okay. When I started my PhD and started all this work, um, the data that we have didn't have any river sources. Um, but I think now there's a lot more data available um, with regards to river inputs. So moving forward, it would be definitely really interesting to have a see um, what impact that would have on the distribution. Great. Yeah, 
So are, are there any um, efforts to, to measure plastic pollution from rivers that goes into the, into the Arctic? Um, isn't, isn't there like the, the Great Rivers Observatory or something like that that um, measures properties of river influxes into the Arctic? Is anybody knowledgeable about that? You know that a lot of focus is on um, measuring plastic fluxes of, in rivers in Southeast Asia. Um, I don't know whether that's also done in the in the Arctic. Uh, no, I, I can imagine I, it's much more challenging there to work. First, you know. Yeah, I know about the uh, the Great Rivers Project. I think it's mostly chemistry, but uh, it would be a question to ask them uh, if they you know started thinking about uh, plastic. Is there any um, measurements within mosaic? Do, do, does anybody know? For CIs, of course. I, I, yes, I, I believe there were measurements during mosaic. I, I was out there on two legs and uh, uh, I know they were out doing some microplastics measurements. I don't know the details of exactly what they did and what they collected. I presume that that's one of the motivations for the uh, NSF project, right? Uh, Alex, David? You mean the mosaic? Mm -hmm. uh, no, actually, no, but we'd be very interested in any, um, okay, anything okay. That, that comes out of that. Um, so ours is primarily focused on laboratory work and then um, modeling, um, so, but obviously, the more observations we have, um, the better. So. I think I did see something Maybe. from the presentation about uh, the microplastics and sea ice, but I can't remember who that, who that was. Yeah, so there is uh, the, the, the data from Mosaic, and that is in the, in the paper. So in, the, in Melanie's uh, review paper, we also talk about Mosaic. But maybe I can um, I can answer Bjorn's uh, question in the chat. It's easier to to just say it rather than to title because it's an interesting question, right? About sediment traps and and uh, the plastic on the on the, on the seafloor in the Arctic. And indeed, there is um, quite a lot that's also in the review paper. But it's interesting. Actually, the first time that Melanie and I started talking about this review papers five years ago or so, it was when she told me that um, in a house garden observatory. So the, uh, the, the observatory that they have in Fram Strait, uh, the AVI uh, maintains there, um, they have some camera systems to, to essentially to check the on the biology and see what kind of crabs and critters and everything crawl around there. Um, and as he was, uh, was, was checking the, the video footage that they, that they retrieved, they, they saw plastic bags just moving past at three kilometers deep. So yeah, that, that's kind of the start almost of this review paper. Like, oh, what is going on here? Entire plastic bags that just wash past a video footage that's three kilometers deep. That is, that's shocking, right? Yeah, the, the question was also a speculation of uh, the faith of uh, the ice. Uh, are these ice transported, uh, meaning, um, all the meteorites, most of it that uh, exists the Arctic goes through the Fram Strait and at the end of the day it melts north of Iceland and southwest depending on the time of year. So yeah, so if there are data from sediment traps and uh, what is the fate or what is the role of bottom water formation in this and where it where it ends up, it's all intriguing questions uh, as regards how it uh, enters into the uh, biosphere in a way. Thank you. Definitely very interesting. Um, Femke, you had a kind of a conversation going on in the chat. Do you want to um, elaborate on the discussion? Yeah, we had a several conversations. Um, well, I'm, I have to admit I'm part of a source of plastic to the Arctic, I'm afraid, because I've been deploying drifters. But because we wanted to limit that, I also used uh, biodegradable 
uh, drifters that were made from a corn-based plastic. And near Greenland, they seem to outlast their predicted lifetime uh, a lot longer. So in the Gulf of Mexico, they lasted, uh, they said, three to six months. And we had some that lasted up to two years near Greenland. So at least uh, the, the degradation of that material is a lot slower in that area. So I don't know how this applies to different types of plastic, though. Very interesting. I had never heard of that. Um, so is it is it fully instrumented drifters? Uh, no, these are quite small, and they're only anchored at about uh, half a meter deep, and they give you a GPS position. Um, but there's, at least they don't spread plastic everywhere. And they're much cheaper, so you can get more trajectories for the same money as a, a larger drifter with more instrumentation. So we had both in the project. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, first time that I, I'm aware that, that actually ocean scientists are actively working to reduce uh, the, the pollution that, that, is, that they are causing, I suppose. Great. Um, David, do you still have your hand up? Or again? Yeah, yeah. I, I had another question I thought of for Eric. So you emphasize the importance of the macro plastics and how the bigger pieces of plastics are breaking down in these little pieces and so forth. And so the efforts to clean up the big pieces before they even have a chance to break down. Um, I find that kind of interesting. So do you have a sense of like how much of the microplastic is local to the Arctic and, or is it macroplastic that's at lower latitudes that breaks down and then is transported up higher? You know, like I'm just trying to think of where the cleanup efforts should be more focused, maybe. Yeah, great question. I, um, the first part of your, of your question is really difficult to answer, like where is this breaking up happening, this fragmentation? I think that's, that's exactly the type of, of, of uh, analysis that we should do with models. Um, you, can, you can simulate this and, uh, uh, well, to the extent, of course, that you have trust in your simulations and your models, well, then maybe it can tell you something about where it is happening. Uh, your second question is super easy, right? Where should you clean it up? Well, as close to the source as possible. <laughs> that that that's the obvious one but um yeah i mean the, the, how where and when the, the the fragmentation happens is uh is the key question in uh, a lot of grant proposals that i'm writing right now cool. awesome um let's end the body see if there's hand up and then i'll um Oh yeah, I, my curiosity is just piqued by this observation of a plastic bag down at 3,000 meters depth. Because one of the questions we have about sort of the entrainment of plastics in the sea ice is a buoyancy question. And so I guess, how does that plastic bag get down to 3,000 meters depth? And, and what do we know about sort of, um, I mean, right, you can measure the density of different plastics, but what do we know about sort of the buoyancy in the wild of, of microplastics. Do you want to start, Alethea, or shall I, or do you have a good answer? Um, with regards to the plastic bag, even if it is a, a buoyant plastic type, um, with plastic bags, if you, like, if you see them in water, you can see that if you get the water inside of the bag, it can be so easily dragged down. Um, and biofouling is a big one that uh, I think quite a lot of people are thinking about. Um, so if you've got something that's got a, a large surface area or a large surface area to volume ratio, then um, even for buoyant plastics, it doesn't take all that much growth um, of organisms on them to help them drop out of that, that floating layer. Um, and once they're at that point, then it can just be quite easily vert vertically mixed downwards. I don't know if you've got anything to add, Eric. Yeah, I think that's that indeed. That that, that 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 anything that grows will will biofoul and will will increase the the, the density. Mm -hmm. Just put the uh, a link to the paper that that Melanie wrote. Yeah. 
with a figure, if you scroll down to figure six, it has uh, photographs of indeed of, of what they found at House Garden. Great. The one final question, uh, Ola? Uh, it, it was also related to Eric's uh, description of this plastic bag at a thousand meters. Um, and uh, I, I was wondering how long does it take for a plastic bag to degrade so that becomes uh, uh, the, the microplastics instead? You're, you, you people are asking way too complicated questions, right? I mean, this, <laughs> what I like so much about, um, about the, the investigation of plastics in our ocean and plastic fiscoceanography, whatever you want to say it is, so much is unknown. Really, everything is an order of magnitudes, right? Uh, whether uh, a decay rate is a month or a year or a decade is even not really well known. And it is probably, as Femke also alluded, it's probably very dependent on the, on the, um, on the local conditions. Um, so there's really, really a lot that still needs to be discovered. And especially if you're asking about numbers, uh, that, that is just not where we are right now. We're only doing processes. Okay. Yeah, I, I, uh, as a comment, I've been wondering about, uh, so during Mosaic, we were launching uh, four weather balloons a day for the entire year. And these weather balloons, of course, they have the balloon themselves. And then there's the styrofoam package with, uh, with some metal electronics inside, plus a little battery. And um, you know, what is, eventually the, those things come down someplace. Uh, and uh, what is the ultimate fate of those? And has anyone ever recovered one of those? Uh, Weisla, who makes the instrument, basically they, they say that they've tried to make the, the styrofoam as biodegradable as possible, um, but uh, I don't really know how long that is uh, for them. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to find it, but I, um, so Kara Lavender Law has once at least started writing a paper about just estimating how much of the oceanographic instrumentation, um, how does that compare to the annual flux of plastic into our ocean? Um, of course, it is all every every bit of plastic that is added to the ocean. It does it. It's not good, and it shouldn't be there. But it is. If we do it for science, it is so much less than say the the five million tons of plastic that enter our own uh, our ocean annually. Uh, yeah, I don't know if if it helps us actually solve the problem or get to solutions quicker, then maybe it's worth it. I find it difficult too, but it's kind of my, my way of, um, of, 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 of overcoming your-, uh, uh, your uh, 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 We rationalize, no, we do the same thing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But at the same time, I think what Pemke is doing is fantastic, right? Where you can use other materials. All right, very, very interesting discussion, everybody. Um, we're past the top of the hour, so I, I'm afraid we have to, to close it off. Um, thanks very much, Eric and Alatia. Very insightful presentations and for bringing your expertise to this discussion. If anybody has any follow-up questions, um, please feel free to reach out to them. Uh, they're more than happy to, to answer any type of questions that, that you might have. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope to see you May 5th for the, the second part of this uh, series on um, marine pollution. All right. Very much yeah. for having me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.